baby on the deals, Nick. I'm not, I'm not feeling so well, uh, but we'll, we'll get through this. Um, I just sent a person to so I'm gonna cancel my office hours. If I pass out here while I'm lecturing, please don't steal my wallet. Uh, Cause they did that last year, and I did not appreciate that, okay? All right, uh, some administrative things. Uh, project two, as everyone is aware of, is already out, and the first checkpoint is next week. Someone posted in Piazza about making checkpoint two tests available. Uh, we'll try to take care of that uh, this week as well. Um, they're also trying, going to try to expose the project one test cases so you can go back and test yourself as well. Tanya, are we doing that already or no? Are we running the, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of it. Um, the midterm exam, believe it or not, it's October 1st, so we've got to talk about the midterm. Midterm exam will be here in class on two weeks from now, on September, uh, sorry, October 17th. It'll be an hour and 20 minute exam, and again, it'll, it'll be here. And it'll cover everything up to uh, whatever the, the lecture before the, that Monday, that Monday's lecture will not be covered on the Wednesday exam. It'll be everything before then, okay? And as I said, they just sent the email saying we have our final exam on Sunday morning at 8.30 a.m. It is what it is. Okay. Uh, this week we have another database, uh, visitor coming. So these guys are Scream. Again, they're, they're another GPU database out of uh, Israel. Um, so Scream, MapD, and Connecticut are, are sort of the, sort of the three most well-funded players in the space. So they're coming on, again, on Thursday, the Wipita in CIC to talk about their system, okay? And I'll, again, I'll, I'll post a reminder on this on Piazza. All right, so as I said last class, now we're at the point we, can, we wanna start talking about actually executing queries. Um, you know, we're, we're building up the layers in the system, we know how to do store, store pages, we know how to have a, a buffer manager, we know how to build indexes on top of that. Now we're going to talk about, all right, how do we actually run queries? That's sort of the whole point of a database system, right? I want to be able to put data in and then ask questions about it. So when we talked about relational algebra before, I sort of said in the beginning that the way it works is that the, you, you give it SQL and it converts the, the SQL into a query plan comprised of relational operators. Um, and so initially these relational operators would just be a logical equivalence to what, you know, what we learned in relational algebra like projections and, and filters uh, and, 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 and joins. And now, at this point in the lecture, we, now we start talking about how to actually to, to generate physical operators, these logical operators, to actually execute the thing that they represent. Right? So how are we actually going to execute a join? Right? What algorithm are we going to use? So the way to sort of think about a query plan is that it's just a tree. And that the, the, the operators are going to have these, these, these edges that show you where the data is flowing in, inside the tree, inside the query plan. So at the very bottom here for this particular query, you know, doing a select and joining A and B together, at the root of the tree, we have the, the scan operators, the things that, that's going to actually access the data, whether it's an index or, a, or the actual heap or the table itself. And then they're going to feed that data up into the next operator, then computes whatever it wants to do, and then passes it on to the next one. So what, the way to think about this is, is it, what I'm showing here, and, and what I'm describing is how it works at a logical level. What we'll see in today's class is, physically, this is not always the way you're gonna execute things, right? You, you may not be passing a single tuple, you may be passing a block of tuples, or the entire output of, of an operator. Um, and then at the very top is always gonna be the root, of, of root node, and that sort of implicitly has an arrow coming out of this, and that's the result that goes back to whoever asked for the query. Right? So we can have data go from here to here, here to here, and then this thing says, all right, whoever invoked this query, here's your result. And that can be you at the terminal, it could be an internal query, it could be a store procedure. Right? It doesn't matter, it just it, it, it goes out where it needs to go. So for today's class, we're gonna talk about three, 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 three important things. So we're gonna first talk about how the data system is gonna, going to process the query plan how it's going to organize the execution of the operators and move data around. And then we'll talk about the access methods of how the data system will actually get to data, whether it's a sequential scan or, a, or an index scan. And then we'll finish up talking about how do you actually evaluate the predicates in, in your where clause and other expressions. Right? Um, and again, we're just building one layer on, on top of each other. So a database system processing model specifies Essentially, how the system is architected or organized to, uh, to execute a query. 
And at a high level, the, the approach is either a top-down or, or top-to-bottom or bottom-to-top approach, right? How are you actually going to invoke these operators? Um, and this is sort of at the engineering level, the physical level of, of the system. So the processing model also specifies what kind of data is going to get moved from one operator to the next. Is it a single tuple? Is it a batch of tuple, tuples? Or is it the, you know, a single column? Or all the data that the operator is ever going to look at, does it shove it up to the next guy? Um, and the reason why there's different, these different processing models is that, as we'll talk about today, there's advantages and disadvantages for, for each of them. So certain systems, like you want to focus on OLAP queries, they'll do it the, you know, usually the vectorized batch model. But if you're doing old T workloads, transactional workloads, that don't have to actually touch a lot of data per operator, then the, the materialization model might be, might, might be a better approach. So again, there's trade-offs to how we're going to engineer the system to execute these queries. Uh, and one approach is better than another for different classes of workloads. So the, the jack of all trades, the most sort of generic or basic approach to processing queries is called the iterator model. So the, this is another example where different people call the same thing different names. So I think in the, our textbook it calls it the iterator model. It might call it the volcano model. And volcano was a system in the a very influential academic system in the late 1980s, early 1990s that sort of described how to do the iterator model in parallel. It might also be sometimes also called the pipeline model. Right? No matter what it is, it's all essentially the same thing. So the basic idea is that the physical operators in a query plan are each going to implement or expose uh, in their API this next fun function. And the idea is every time you invoke next, to, on an operator, it's going to give you back the next tuple that it processed and then went to you to process. Right, you sort of think of a for loop, you iterate through and say next, 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 next on an operator, and it's going to keep giving you out tuples one by one. Then at some point when you run out of tuples, like you scan the entire table, you reach the very end, you just re return back a null, say, you asked me for more, I don't have any more, so don't, don't ask me again. So this is an example of what's called top-down or top-to-bottom pr processing. Because we're going to start at the root, and the root's going to say, all right, I need to do, I need, I'm going to need to compute whatever operator I represent. I need to compute it, but I need tuples to do this. And I'm going to have children in my query plan, and I go at, invoke next on my children, and I ask them to give me the next tuple that they have. And then they might not have anything, so they need to go down and, you know, and traverse the tree until you reach the very bottom, and you reach your access methods, the things that are actually scanning, scanning the data. So let's look at a real high example like this. So normally, I don't like to show code in any lecture or, or talk. Uh, but for this, I think it's sort of the only way, because it sort of it'll convey the, the idea uh, pretty clearly. So again, this is that query we had before. We're doing a join on A and B. Um, and then we have a simple filter where value is greater than 100. And so this would be the, 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 the query plan that the, the, the data system would generate for this SQL. So the way to think about this now in the iterator model is that for each of these operators, you're going to have essentially a for loop. And so the for loop is just going to iterate over uh, its children and call next on its children to get the next tuple that it, it wants to process. So starting at the root, right, so you, you sort of organize these, starting at the root, uh, this guy is going to loop through. It's going to have a single child. So this, it's this one here. So it's on this join operator. So it calls next to the next operator because it, it wants to, you know, wants to do the projection but it doesn't have any tuples, right? It depends on this child, so calls next, goes down to the next guy, to, to, to the join operator here, same thing. So this has two children, left and right, so it's gonna call left on its child, um, which is then gonna go down here. And now here, this, we're at this A here, so now we're just gonna scan over A, and there's, there's this emit function that basically says, like, an, like a yield uh, clause in Python, or iterator model in Python, where you just have a for loop and you say, all right, someone's evoking me. Here's the next thing that, that you asked me for. So it's going to emit that tuple uh, here, and that gets shoved up to, to the next guy, or uh, up above it. Right? And so the top guy is going to do this uh, on, on operator two, doing the join. On the left, it's going to keep doing this until this thing comes back and says, I don't have anything. And then it switches down to the next for loop on its right child, and same thing. It's going to evoke next on the right child, and this thing then evokes next on its parent, or sorry, its child, when now we're doing the scan on table B. 
right? So again, going from the top, we, ask, we, we call next, next, next going down until we reach the very bottom. And at some point, we'll, we'll reach something that knows how to get tuples, either from an index or either from a table. And it shoves them up to the next operator. The next operator can do whatever processing it wants to do. Uh, and then maybe emit it back up to the, the next operator. So the key thing to point out here is, part of the reason why it's called the pipeline approach, is for this path in the query plan, we have a pipeline, meaning we can take one tuple and we can, execute, we can pass it through a pipeline of multiple operators before we have to go back and get the next one. So in this case here, we're doing the, doing the loop over the right child, calls next, we go down here, it's going to do an uh, iteration over its child, calls next here. And at this point, as we're scanning B, it emits a tuple. And then immediately, we can evaluate the predicate. And if it passes, then we call emit. And then it gets passed up here. So it's, we don't have a context switch. It's not the right word, but get the basic idea. We're not switching to the next tuple when we get the tuple here. We do whatever processing we need to do on it, then pass it up to the next guy. And this is why this approach is widely used in disk-based systems, because if I, bring, I, have, I have a tuple in memory, I want to do as much work as I can while it's in memory before I go back and get the next one. Because I, I may not have enough memory to put my, all my intermediate results in memory, and I may have to spill to disk. So the worst case scenario would be I, I, I need a tuple, I fetch it from disk, I emit it up here, and then I process it, and then before I pass it up here, I go back and get the next one, but now I don't have enough space to store the tuple that, that just, I just got. So that gets swapped out the disk. And now I fetch another page to get the next one. But then when now when I get back up here, I got to go back the, out the disk and get all the other ones. I, I you know, all the ones that passed. I had them in memory here, but then I swapped them out. So the pipeline approach is, again, try to do as much work on a single tuple for as long as you can while it's in memory. So as I said, this, this approach is the most widely used uh, processing model in, in almost every single database system. So this is a small smattering of, uh, of systems that are out there. It's pretty much everyone. But these are the ones I can verify based on the documentation and, w and, what, and what I know about how they work. Um, so again, the idea is to generate query plans that, that can allow you to have these long pipelines of keeping things in memory as much as possible. But at some point, you hit what are called pipeline breakers, where you can't keep going up the query plan with the tuple you're processing. You have to go back and get more. So these would be any times you need to get see all the data on one side of the tree before you can go on to the next one. So the most obvious one is, is a join. right? So in this case here, I need to see all the tuples from A and, do my, and do my, build my hash table before I can put anything up to here. Right? And I need to do the join here before, actually in this case here, if you do the join, you match, you can push it up here. But this side of the tree, you have to see everything before you can go down the other side. So right, as I said, joins, subqueries, order by, these are things again, where you have to see everything before you can make a final decision on what you're going to spit out to, to your parent. Um, the other nice thing about this is that it makes it really easy to use limits and control the, the size of your output because now you'll, all you have to do is, as you call, if I call next and I get, you know, I, I only want 10 tuples. If I call next and I get 10 tuples, I'm done, right? I can just stop at the, at the you know, whatever, whatever point of the tree that says, all right, I know there's a limit here. I don't have to worry about, you know, processing more data than I actually need. We'll see this later in a few weeks when we talk about parallelization, but this approach is also very easy to parallelize as well. Um, and that's what the volcano model was originally, uh, originally proposed, a way to, to have these little next guys run in separate threads and then coalesce the results to some later point in the tree. But we'll worry about that later. All right, the next processing model is called the materialization model. And this is sort of a bottom-up approach where instead of having this next function that a parent calls on a child, you start at the, at the bottom and you have the operators do whatever it is computation they want to do on the data that, that they're reading. And only when they, when they have everything done, they've computed the entire answer that they're going to ever answer, you know, that they want to generate, then you shove up data to, to the next operator. And you never go back and evoke that operator again. Because at that point, it's, it's, it's done all the work that it needs to do. All right? So 
we'll see this in the next slide. The tricky thing about this is, as, as I said before, in the iterator model, it's really good to do, it's really easy to do limits because you just stop calling next when you got all the data that you need. In this case here, you may, the limit may be in the upper parts of the tree, and you may not know that, oh, I'm going to scan a billion tuples, but I only really need 10. So if you materialize the, all the entire billion tuples and shove that up the tree, you may not know until much later that, oh, I had a limit that said I only needed 10 of them. So the way to get around this is to just embed logic in these lower operators to say, do a scan, but only give me 10 things. Right, sort of inlining one operator inside of another. All right, so again, same query we had before. And now what's different is that inside of our, our the, the, inside of each operator implementation, now we have these little output buffers. And what'll happen is we say we start at the very bottom here on the scan on A. We're just gonna scan through it, look at every single tuple and just put it in our output buffer. And then when we're done, we, we shove it up to the to to the our parent. So then we come back down here and do the same thing on B, scan through all that materialize the entire output into our output buffer, shove that into three, which then does the predicate, the predicate evaluation, shove that up into four, where we then finally do the join. All right? So, all right, and then it goes, goes all the way top. So I, I sort of already said this in the beginning, but just, just make sure you understand what's going on. What kind of workload would this be bad for, this approach? OLTP or OLAP? Transactional or analytical? What do the queries look like in transactional workloads? You know, like, so transactional workloads would be like reading a single tuple. You log into Amazon, right? It's Andy's account, Amazon. You just look at that. It's like, you know, one tuple within all my orders, right? Or if I put something in my cart, I'm adding one record into my cart, right? So you're, you're not touching a lot of data. For, per query. In analytical workloads, I want to do things like compute the average uh, you know, stock price of Microsoft over a 10-week you know, window or something like that. So I'm scanning lots of data. And I'd have to move a lot of data from one operator to the next. So the materialization approach is better for transactional workloads because they're not touching a lot of data. So the size of your output buffer going from one operator to the next is going to be small. In the case of OLAP queries, it, it's, unless you try to push as much logic as you can down into the lower parts of the plan, you're going to end up moving more data than maybe you need to. All right? So uh, VoltDB does this, which is, again, VoltDB was the academic predecessor, or sorry, Volti, I wrote the system called HDOR. HDOR uses the materialization model. VoltDB is the commercial version of HDOR. And as far as I can know from at least a year or two ago, last time I looked, they still do it the same way that we did it originally in, in when we wrote the system in the university of doing the materialization model. Because this is the right way to do this in a OLTP environment. Because when everything's in memory, calling next is actually becomes expensive. Um, and so you want to avoid that as much as possible. MoneyDB is an academic OLAP system, but they still use the materialization model. I haven't looked at the documentation to see why. Then high rise was another academic uh, OLAP system that they, I think they were doing materialization model, but then they threw away all the code and started rewriting it. But I haven't looked to see what they're actually doing. So you sort of see this trade-off between like how much data I want to move around and how much overhead I have of calling next and and, and you know going from the top top down versus the bottom up. Um, the last model we're talking about is vector vectorization model it is a sort of a hybrid of the two. So like the iterator model, we're still going to have a next function. So we're going to call next, 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 going down the tree. But instead of passing a single tuple in our emit function, we're actually going to pass a vector of tuples. Sort of think of this like a mini batch uh, as we go along. And then what's going to happen is the internal loop is going to know how to process this mini batch in an efficient manner um, you know, using vectorization or SIMD or things like that. Right? So let's, let's see what it looks like. So now what I've done is it looks, it looks sort of like the, the, the materialization model. Sorry, it's a combination of the materialization model and the iterator model. I now have my output buffers, but inside my output buffers, I, uh, I check to see whether uh, I've reached a certain, when it's reached a certain size. That usually depends on what the harbor looks like. 
I then emit it up to whoever needs it. And implicitly, when I call emit here at my output buffers, I'm clearing it out. So the next time I come back in the loop, I start with a, a fresh set. All right? And it goes down like this. So again, th this approach is ideal for OLAP queries. It sort of seems obvious. Um, but the first systems that really didn't start end up doing it until much later, uh, in, like, in like late 2000s, VectorWise was sort of the first one. This is the approach that we were originally doing in Peloton. Uh, I, we're still working on the new ones, so I'm not sure what we're doing. Um, Presto does this from Facebook. And then SQL Server, Oracle, and IBM all have these sort of query column-based or, or vectorized-based accelerators for in-memory data sets. And they all use the vectors, vectorized approach. OK? Yes? So is this the only type of model that for This one here? Uh, there, for disk-based systems, this is probably the best. For uh, in-memory system, we'll cover that next semester, there's, there's another approach. But this is, this is probably the, for, this is the most common one. OK. All right, again, this is just a summary of the different models we talked about. Right, iterative volcano is basically uh, you know, the, the sort of most general approach. Um, it you know people use it for OLAP and OLAP together. Vectorize is a top-down approach, and this is good for OLAP queries. And then virtualization is is a bottom-up approach that's good for uh, OLAP queries. Okay. All right. So as I said before, the the in our query plan the 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 nodes at the bottom of the query plan, the operators at the bottom, are, are access methods. These are the ways that the system is going to, going to actually access data that's stored in their table. So there's not really a, a, an existing, there's no equivalent in the relational algebra for an access method. Right? It's just sort of something you have to do. Right? It's a physical thing in order to get data out of a tuple or data out of an uh, um, index. So, at a high level, there's basically two types of access methods you can have. You can have a sequential scan, and you can have an index scan. And then there are ways to combine multiple indexes, we'll, we'll talk about in a second. And these are sort of called multi-index access methods. So Oracle has a bunch of different names for the access methods. There's like heap scan or row ID scan. But to the best of my knowledge, these are all just going to be uh, the same thing. Right? It's, either, it's either one or the other. Right? So again, we're, we're talking about these guys here down here. So sequential scan is, is pretty straightforward to understand. You're basically going to iterate over every single page in a table. Uh, you're going to retrieve it from the buffer pool. And then you're going to iterate over that table to see whether it, you should include it in your output. Right? Doesn't matter, like, this doesn't matter whether you're using a materialization mo processing model or, or Volcano. It's, it's, it's going to be the same approach. And so internally, the data system is going to maintain a uh, cursor that tracks the last page slot that examines so that if, if you're doing this in, in an iterative manner, you know where you pick you pick up pick up where you left off, all right? So um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not feeling so good here. All right, well, let's keep going. Um, I may I may I may have to shut, shut uh, cut it off, but let's get through this real quick. All right, so sequential scans. Uh, in general, this is always the worst thing you want to do to way to execute queries, um, right? Because it's it's the, it's the slowest thing. You have to look at every single tuple and every single page. But there are some optimizations we can do to, to speed this up. Uh, we've already talked about prefetching before. Uh, we'll talk about parallelization la later. We talked about buffer pool bypass. But I want to cover the, these three things here. Zone maps, late materialization, and heap clustering. So zone maps are basically a pre-aggregated, uh, pre-computed aggregations that we're going to maintain for the attributes in a single page. And the idea is that when a zone map versus side, so when a query, when a, when a data system says I want to execute a query on a uh, on a page, um, it has to check the zone map to see whether it should even bother accessing that page. So the idea here is that we have original data, we have this column here, a bunch of values. So in our zone map, we can process, we can pre-compute some aggregations, like you know the min, max, average, standard, things like that. So when our query comes along. Um, we, we, you know, for in this case here, for a value greater than 600, we could look in the zone map and say, well, we know for this page there's no value greater than 400, so we don't need to look at it. Um, yeah, guys, I am not feeling good. I think I'm going to pass out. So we're going to stop, okay? Sorry.
Let's just say that I haven't been that sick since I ate at Taco Bell when I was in high school. So I've been sleeping the last 48 hours. But now I'm fine. That's what the stomach flu is. It comes and goes, right? Um, so I like how all, I profess how much I love the flu shot, and that doesn't protect you from, you know, terrible diarrhea. Okay, so we're going to pick up where we left off last time. Uh, we'll go a little quickly uh, so that we can get into what we should have talked about today. So again, reminder, project, che project two, checkpoint one is due on Monday. The midterm exam will be on the 17th. I'll send an update about that. And there'll be a review session the day before that for, for that class. And then tomorrow, the ScreamDB guys are coming to give a talk in uh, the CIC. So where we left off before I almost passed out uh, was that we were talking about processing models. And we said these are the different ways we can, we can organize or, or architect the system to read tuples and, and process the query. Right? We said that the volcano model or the iterator model was the most common approach. Most data systems use this, um, where you have this next function you call next, next, next going down, and you grab single tuples at a time from your access methods at the bottom. Then we said that the alternatives would be the vectorized approach, where it looks like the volcano model, but instead of getting a single tuple, you get a batch or a vector of tuples. And this is better for OLAP queries, because you can do vectorized operations on, on batches of queries. And then the other approach is the materialization model, where Instead of going from the top going down, you start from the bottom and go up, and you, each operator shoves up the entire output or all of the tuples that it, wants to, that it processed into its next operator. And you don't go into the next one until the, the one below it finishes. All right. So this is all a bit of a blur, so we'll just go over this uh, from the very beginning, uh, was the access methods. So the access methods are how we're actually going to access the data in our database. Right? It's, it's the bottom part of the query plan. Right, there's, no, there's, there's no equivalent operator for an access method in, a, in the relational algebra, because relational algebra, again, was just an, an abstraction over how we would execute queries. So now we need to talk about how do we actually implement these access methods? How do we actually get the data we need from, from our database in order to, to pass them up into the, to our query plan and do additional operations on them? So at a high level, there's only really two approaches. You either do an index scan or do a sequential scan. Right? There's really the only way you, two ways you can actually get data. Uh, there's things like materialized views, but those are usually stored as just tables. If you use multiple indexes, it's still an index scan. So at a high level, there's essentially two classes of approaches. But we'll look at also what happens when you have multiple indexes, or what Postgres calls a bitmap scan, because this is kind of confusing. When you look at explain, you look at the query plan, and Postgres says, oh, I'm doing a bitmap scan. You may not know exactly what that is. It's, it's essentially just doing an index scan. So we'll look at, look at both of these and what optimizations we can apply uh, for each of them. So as we said many times throughout the semester, the sequential scan is the fallback option for a database system. If we don't have an index, we don't have any fancy thing we can do to actually derive the answer, we always can just scan the underlying tables. And it's essentially just nested for loops. For every single page in our tuple, we're going to then iterate every, every single tuple in each page and just do whatever it is that we need to do. Right? We, can, we can compute an aggregation, apply a predicate, do filtering. Right? We're just going over it one by one. So how this is typically implemented is that, the, the, especially in, in, a, in a volcano model or iterator model, is that the database system is going to maintain a, an internal cursor for your query that just keeps track of where did I leave off uh, in the scan. So if you're familiar with writing iterators in Python, you have that yield function. Right? That's just syntactic sugar underneath the covers. Python is maintaining its own iterator, sorry, its own cursor to know that when you go and ask for the next thing, it knows how to jump where it left off in, in its, in its uh, sequential scan. So we're going to do this on, on a per query basis. Right? And in a materialization model, we don't have to do this because we're just going to read everything and shove it up. But if you're doing the vectorize or the volcano model, when you call next and, and emit the tuple back up to you, when you call next again, you need to know where you left off. In the case of the sequential scan, it's just page ID and, uh, and offset. So. There's not really any magical way we can make sequential scans run faster, right? Because again, it's, it's, it's going to be bound by how fast we can read pages from disk, right? If we, if we need to read 1,000 pages, we, we have to read 1,000 pages. Uh, but there are some optimizations we can do to try to eliminate or reduce the number of pages we have to read uh, to, to minimize the, the amount of I.O. we have to do. So we've already sort of talked about prefetching, right? Prefetching was a, was a way to know I'm going to scan ahead a bunch of pages, so let me go ahead and fetch a bunch of them in order, bring them to my buffer pool so that when I actually need them, they're there for me. We'll talk about how to do parallel sequential scans in a few more lectures when we talk about parallel query execution. 
And then we also talked about the buffer pool bypass in Informix and Postgres, where instead of polluting the, your buffer pool with the, the pages you're reading during the sequential scan, you just maintain a little uh, side buffer for your query that's just, you know, the, that only your query uses. And that way you don't, you don't have sequential flooding. You're not, you know, you're not blowing away all the, the locality information you have in your cache. So I said I want to now talk about these three other optimizations we can do. Again, these are things that we can apply to, to potentially make the amount of work we have to do during sequential scans uh, be less. So zone maps are a, a way to pre-compute aggregations on individual pages and then use those pre-compute aggregations to know what pages you can skip during a sequential scan. Right? So the way to think about this is I have a bunch of pages and I have a bunch of columns in those pages and I'm going to go ahead and pre-compute the standard aggregation functions we have in, in the SQL standard. You know, count, min, max, sum, average, things like that. And we're going to store this zone map in a separate page different than from the original data page. And the zone map itself is going to be pretty small so we can store multiple pages the, the zone maps for multiple pages in a single page. And so what will happen is now if we come along with a sequential scan operator like this, select star from table where value is greater than 600. If we had to do, if we didn't have a zone map, we'd have to go fetch the page and just scan in linearly inside that page to see whether we have any values that match this. With a zone map instead, we can examine the predicate and say, well, it's looking for values that are greater than 600. In my zone map, I know the max value for this column here is 400. So there's never going to be a tuple that, is, that will match my predicate, so therefore I don't even need to bother looking at this page. I just go ahead and just skip it. And again, the idea is that the, the data pages will be, much, will, will be much larger than the zone map pages. So for, with a single page fetch to go get a zone map, uh, I, that may encompass or cover maybe a, a dozens of pages. And I can use that to figure out which ones I actually need to go look at. So this idea is, is, is not new. It's been around for a while. Uh, Oracle calls it zone maps. And for better or worse, you know, in, in the database community, when you say zone map, we just mean the Oracle you know, brand name of it. Um, but it's not specific to Oracle. It's used in a bunch of different systems. So IBM has it in, in DB2 for blue. Uh, Cloudera uses this in Impala. Netiza has this. Uh, Vertica. It's in the Parquet uh, file format for cloud systems we'll talk about later in the semester. So this approach is used all over the place. MemSQL has this. Sometimes they're called pre-computed aggregates. But if you say zone maps, they essentially mean, mean the same thing. The next thing we can do is call late materialization for column store systems. So remember, for column store systems, I said that in general, you can think of every single column or attribute for a table will be stored in pages by themselves. And so as I'm processing the query, I only fetch the pages that have the columns that I actually need to, in order to process the query. So in late materialization, the idea is, is sort of a, a, a logical extension to this, is that as I'm going up the tree of my query plan, I only go fetch the pages that I need for that particular operator. I don't try to stitch the entire tuple back together. Right, so say that we have a query like this, select average on C from food, joining on bar, and then we have our join predicate, and then a where clause where A is greater than 100. So say our query plan looks like this, and we're going to focus on the, the, the right side of the tree, uh, the scan on foo. So as we're doing the sequential scan on foo, and we want to apply our predicate on A, we know that the only thing at this point to, to evaluate that predicate is just A. So the only column we need to go read, the only pages we need to go read, is for the attribute A. And then when we're done scanning, we actually can throw away any values of A that we brought into memory and only pass up offsets. Because we know at this point in, in, in the query plan, because we know what the query plan is, because it's, SQL is declarative, we know that there's no other point up in this tree where we're ever going to have to look at A again. So we don't even need to pass it around. We can just throw it away and just pass up our offsets. Same thing, when we go up here and do our join, we only need to look at B, or just the, the subset of B that match our offsets, pass then more offsets up to the aggregation, and now at this point we have to materialize Right? We can't pass back the user offsets because that's an internal representation, that internal you know, marker that means nothing to the outside world. So at this point, we, do mater we material materialize the tuple, meaning we go grab for the offsets, we grab the data that it actually needs. So this is useful in some cases where the offsets will be much smaller than the actual tuples themselves, the values of the tuples themselves. 
let's say I had, you know, uh, C was a, was a var char 100. And so that would be, you know, 100 characters. I would have to pass around from one operator to the next. But with late materialization, I could just pass around a 64-bit integer per tuple. And then only when I had to go get, you know, get the get result back to the user, then I go fetch the pages I need for C. Right? So again, it's sort of, this is, you can do this in a decomposition storage model or the column store system because the columns are broken up. You couldn't do this in a, easily in a, in, a, in a row store because when you go fetch the tuple, you're going and fetching the, uh, the, the, all the rows for it. All right, so the last optimization is called heap clustering. So we've sort of already talked about this before when we talked about uh, index organized tables. Right? The idea is that we're going to have an index that's going to tell us how we should store tuples in our pages. Right? So say we have our index like this. We have a sort direction. Right? Going along the leaf nodes, we're going from left to right. Say it's going in ascending order. And then our pointers now from the index to our, our, our tuples inside our pages will be sorted in that order, right? So now that means that for some cases, instead of maybe doing a leaf node scan uh, along here and going fetch, fetching, fetching the pages one by one, I can maybe just jump to one location and just fetch the, 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 the table pages because I know they're going to be in the order that, that I want. So as I said, so we talked about this before. We said that some database systems like MySQL, for example, don't actually have separate table pages. They store the tuples themselves inside the leaf pages of the index, right? So that essentially you get a clustering index for free. In other systems, like in MySQL, or sorry, in SQL Server and Oracle, you can tell it that you want this index to be a clustering index, and it'll maintain the the, the tuples sorted in the pages like this. Um, in systems like Postgres, and you can declare that you want a clustering index, so they have a cluster command, and it'll do this sorting for you, but it doesn't actually maintain it. So every single time you update the table after you run cluster, it's not going to guarantee that the, they're going to be in sorted order. This will make more sense when we talk about how they do concurrency control or multi-versioning. But in general, they're not doing it because that would be extra work. For like something like MySQL, because the tuples are stored you know, in the pages themselves, or the, the leaf pages, then they get it for free. So again, this allows you to do some things like jump ahead to where you think you, the tuple you actually need will be, instead of having to look at, at more, more pages. All right, so the other access method is to do index scan. And we talked about this before. We talked about how to, in the case of like a covering index, we can process the entire query just on what actually being stored in the index. Um, the index scan is basically going to allow us, us to figure out what pages we've had to go read in order to process the query. And that's avoiding, again, having to do a sequential scan. So the question of what index to pick uh, depends on a lot of different things. Depends on what attributes are in the index, in the different indexes that you have available to you. Depends on what attributes you're actually referencing in your query in the where clause or other parts of the, of, of the query. Depends on the, the value domain of the index. Like if I have a, an index on whether you know, a, a student is, their gender is male, female, right? That's not going to be that useful because it's going to be 50-50 mostly. Um, depends on how the, the, what the where clause looks like. Do you have conjunctions or disjunctions, ands or ors? And then it depends on whether they're unique keys or non-unique keys. So basically what happens is you write your select, select statement in, in SQL, and it's up to the database system's job to figure out which index you want to use potentially for an index scan. So that particular question we're going to focus on later uh, in lecture 17 after the midterm when we talk about query optimization. Right, this is a pretty hard problem, and this is, there's a lot of literature on how to do these kind of things. But for our purposes, we'll look at it at a high level, and then we'll see uh, what are the different design decisions or implementation decisions we can have how to execute a query for an index scan based on these, these different questions. So let's look at a little simple example. So say we have a single table of students, and we have 100 tuples, and we have two indexes. We have one index on the student's age and one index on the student's department. And we're going to run this query here, select star from students, where age is less than 30, department equals CS, and the country equals US. So we don't have an index on, on the country, just department and age. So the first scenario would be there are 99 people in, in the, the table that are under the age of 30, which is usually accurate for universities. Um, but then there's only, only two people in the CS department. So which of these two indexes would we, would we actually want to pick? We have to pick one. Right? So we have an index on age, but then there's, there's 99 people out of 100 under age of 30. And we're looking for students under age of 30. 
So is the index going to be really helpful there? No, because it's going to fat 99% of them anyway, right? And then we have only two people in the CS department out of 100. So in that case here, we, if we had an index on department, right, we can jump exactly to the two tuples that we, that we want. Right, so the idea here is that we want to pick indexes that are going to be the most selective for us. That's going to filter out the most things as soon as possible. It's the lowest portion in the, in the query plan. Because the idea is we want to minimize the amount of data we have to transfer from one operator to the next. That's sort of what late materialization was trying to do. Minimize how much data you have to you move around. And the idea here is, again, to filter out things as soon as possible by like picking the index that's the most selective. Right? If you can reverse this, say there's 99 people in the CS department, but only two people under age of 30. In this case here, we'd want to pick the index on age because, again, that'll find the two people that we want right away. So there's nothing really special in an index scan. Right? You, you, you know what the predicate is in your where clause. You know what attributes are in your index. And you follow it, you follow the, you know, the tree or do a hash lookup, and you find the things you're looking for, and then you just pass them up to the next operator. All right, so there's really nothing interesting there. It's pretty straightforward. Where things get interesting is when you actually use multiple indexes together. So these are called the multi index scans. Postgres again calls them the bitmap scans. Uh, and the idea here is that, say, the, the data system recognizes, oh, for my particular query on this table, I have two indexes that both look pretty good. And, I, and instead of picking one versus another, I actually want to use both of them and then combine their, their, their result set together and use that as, as, as the, you know, the result set for my operator. So the idea here is that uh, we'll, we'll take all the indexes we want to use and we're going to compute sets of record IDs that match the particular predicate we're, we're evaluating on our index. And then we're going to combine together the, 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 the records, record ID sets from the different indexes. Uh, either using a, uh, a, a union or an intersection. Intersection if it's an and, union if it's an or. And then for all those record IDs that come out of the, the matching set, we then go do our lookup to go find the original the, the tuples in the pages, and we pass them up to, to the next operator in the tree. So we go back to our example here. Again, we have the two indexes on age and department. <laughs> so what we'll do is we'll first retrieve all the record IDs in the age index that match age less than 30. And then we'll retrieve all the record IDs that match department equals CS in the second index, take the intersection of the two of them, right, because it's, a, it's, a, it's an and clause in our, in our predicate, and then fetch those tuples. Then we go check now to see whether the country is, is US. Visually, it looks like this. right? So again, we do a lookup on age, less than 30 in, in that first index. We get the set of all, the, all record IDs that match that do a lookup on the department index, get a set of all those record IDs, and now we just take the intersection of the two of them, and that's, that's the ones we know match age less than 30 and department equals CS. So you can implement this with a bitmap, that's what Postgres does. You can use a bloom filter, you can use hash sets, hash tables. Right? Doesn't actually matter as long as you can have set membership and a way to combine them together. All right? All right, so the... One potential problem we're going to have, and we'll see this uh, come up again when we talk about sorting, is that the, if an index is not ordered on the key that we want to, uh, if the index is not ordered on the key that we want to do our lookup on, then we may end up with a really inefficient index scan. And it may actually be better if we'd done just a straight sequential scan. All right, so again, here's our index. It's, say the, it's, the scan direction is in this, this way based on some key. And now if we follow along the leaf nodes and start reading, reading the, the, the tuples, or you know, following the, the pointers down to our pages, we'll see that they're going all over the place. Because right? it's an unclustered index. The index is just pointing to where those tuples are. It's not saying anything how it's physically sorted on the actual uh, table pages. So now if we, do a, if we follow along the, the leaf nodes and do our sequential scan or index scan that way, what will end up happening is that we're going to basically thrashing our buffer pool because we're going to be fetching pages in uh, and then throwing them away immediately to go fetch another page. So say a really simple example is I only have space for one page in my buffer pool. So if I do my scan for all of these pages following along the leaf node orders, then what will happen is that all these diff the, the different boxes represent every single time I had to go fetch a page. Because right, I'm, I'm not being mindful of the locality of where these, the data is actually being stored. 
I'm just blindly saying, oh, I want page 102, let me go get it. All right, now I need page 103. Well, I have to take 102 out, put 103 in. So again, so I'm just ping-ponging pages in and out, and that's going to make things uh, go really slow. So a simple optimization is that just do the index scan first. Don't actually fetch any tuples. Just figure out what are all the pages I'm actually going to need to access, or the records I need to access. And then you sort those, those, those tuples, the record IDs, based on the page ID. So now you go then and say, all right, well, all right, I'll, do all the fe I'll fetch page 101 first, do all the reads I need for that, then fetch page 102 and do all the reads for that. And I never go back to page 101. So what went from you know, maybe over, over 10 page reads, or 10, 10 page IOs, uh, before we did the sorting, now ends up going to be the four, which is the bare minimum we actually need to execute this scan. So even though you have an index, doesn't mean everything's gonna go super fast for you. Right? You want to be a little bit smarter about how you, uh, you know, schedule the, the disk I.O. operations you want to do. And again, this is another example of the beauty of the relational model because we don't care that the output is not in the order that you expect it. Right? Unless you tell us what you want to order by, it's going to come out in any order that it wants. So if we just took your query and executed it almost exactly how you expressed it, we would end up maybe in this situation here, and that would be slow. But we'd be a little bit smarter and say, all right, well, if I sort things ahead of time, then I'll, I'll basically have sequential access and I'll have good locality because I'm reusing every page, every page I read in, I'm reading as much data as I can out of it before I move on to the next page. So this is, this is a uh, standard technique that, that a, lot of system, a lot of systems use. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is how do we actually evaluate predicates? So we have these where clauses, we have these expressions. How are these actually represented and how we actually implement them? So the... The way to think about it, as we talked about before, is the, the query plan itself is a tree, and then inside each operator in our tree, we can have another, uh, another tree called the expression tree. And this represents you know, the where clause or whatever expression we have for that particular operator. So the nodes in the tree are going to represent all the different types of expressions you can have, comparisons, arithmetic expressions, conjunctions, disjunctions, things like that. Um, and essentially, you just evaluate them, and they return you know, true or whatever the type of value they want to return, and then you use that to figure out wh whether you know, tuple matched a predicate or what's the output you want for that, for that tuple in the query. So let's take our simple query like this. Uh, in our where clause, we have AID equals BID and B.val is greater than 100. So we would represent that in a tree like this. So at the root, we have the conjunction clause, and that returns true or false. And then on one side, we have the equal sign. And on the other side, we have the, the greater than sign. Right? At a high level, this is how every data system is going to represent uh, these expressions. Let's see how, actually how, you, how you evaluate them. So say we have, our, uh, we have a query like this, and it's a prepared statement. So we have a, we have a clause with a, uh, a where clause with a, a, a placeholder for, for a value at runtime. So as we're doing our sequential scan or index scan, for every single tuple that, that we're going to evaluate this expression on, we would maintain some execution context about what we're examining at that point in time. So say I have 1,000 tuples, and for every single tuple, I'm going to main, build this execution context and then traverse the tree to see whether its values are true or not. So at the top here, you see that we have the, the current tuple that we're looking at in our scan, the query parameters that, that'll get passed in at runtime to fill that value in, and then the schema for the tuple that, that we're evaluating here. Because we need to know, you know, in the expression tree, it'll say, I want to look at attribute you know, uh, val. You need to know where that is in, in the actual tuple. So, we did basically just walk through this tree in a breath-first manner. Right? So we first talk about, you know, at the root is equal sign. We go down to the left, it says attribute value. So we know that this is a reference to the, uh, for the current tuple, what attribute we want. We want value. So we do look up in the table schema and say, well, what offset in the tuple is, corresponds to the name value. And then we look in the current table, or the current tuple that we're looking at, and we get the value that we want, 1,000. Traverse down the other side, we have the parameter uh, expression. That tells us we want 999 because we, we want the first one in our query parameters. We go to constant. It's just, just one, so this output's one. And then everything gets fed up now into the tree until this thing produces uh, you know, true or false. And if it's true, or fa if it's true, then we know whatever tuple we were examining satisfied our predicate, and we can produce it in our, in our intermediate output. All right, pretty straightforward. So the, what I'll say is that this is this pretty much, as I said, this is pretty much how everyone does it. Uh, this is actually a, sl a slow way to do it. Um, and the current trend, which we'll cover in the advanced class, is actually using code generation or just-in-time compilation, is 
instead of traversing this tree, we'll actually generate a program to compile this and run this exactly in machine code. So instead of saying, uh, you know, does something equal 99 plus 1, I'll just, you know, in traverse that tree to generate that value, I'll just generate machine code that does the exact same thing. And it's way faster. There was an announcement, I think Postgres just added this in Postgres 11, which comes out later this year. But a lot of the major commercial systems do this. All right, so the main takeaway from all of this is that the same query plan can be executed in a bunch of different ways. Uh, and one approach versus another will, will have different advantages or disadvantages based on what kind of workload you're trying to, trying to deal with. Um, and, it, it, and for at least most systems, they're going to try to use index scan as much as possible because it's always going to be faster. Now, there are some systems, like Vertica, for example, that have no indexes at all. It won't even let you declare them. Um, but they pre-sort everything, which is essentially almost the same thing as, a, as, a, as an index. And then in the expression tree, just again, just to show you that what, what they look like, to understand how these where clauses are going to get evaluated. The way I'm showing you here is super flexible. You can have any kind of expression you'd want could be represented in these trees. Uh, but it's going to be slow the way if you traverse it manually. OK? So any questions about this? <laughs> That's my favorite all time. <laughs> What is it? Yes, it's the S T Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I can do it like a Geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, Duke. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cuff say I'm a fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Show. Here I come, Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watch, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a four. Six pack 40 act gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>